Hello and welcome to Fresh Perspectives. My name is Gail and you probably remember um, an episode we did early in the winter with a man named John Jablonski who is the executive director of the Watershed Conservancy of Chautauqua County and um, my guest today is somebody who works with him and uh, her name is Carol Markham. Uh, thank you for coming on, Carol. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Um, before we really get going on our conversation, I want to uh, bring up the book that I forgot to bring with me to show <laughs> last week, uh, The World According to Monsanto. Uh, and the author's name is Marie Monique Robin. And uh, this is what the cover of the book looks like. So if any of you, I would highly recommend you reading this if you can get your hands on a copy of it. So, Carol, uh, you work, the topic today is gonna be landscaping and lakescaping. And um, what is your job title? What, what was it you said you were? Uh, um, I'm the conservationist. Conservationist, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And Lakescapes is actually a program that we created two years ago. Um, and it deals a lot with homeowners and landscaping. And um, it basically includes a free um, on-site yard consultation. And we talk about many different things, easy things that you can do in your yard um, for not only water quality, but for wildlife habitat and just making your yard and the community healthier and um, more attractive to not only yourself but to our local birds and bees and pollinators. Right. So. And not only does this tie in with the program I did with John, but it also ties in with um, Bill Kuick's talk that we did last Saturday or on the last episode. Now, uh, these topics, were they something you studied in college? Um, and if not, how did you get your education? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, actually my education, I have a marine biology um, oh, do you really? <laughs> undergrad degree. Oh. Um, and then I have my master's in fisheries management. So I'm technically oh. a fisheries biologist, um, oh, okay. but I've always, um, my hobby has always been plants. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a self-taught person in terms of knowing my native plants. And um, yeah, I just uh, took some years off to be a mom. Mm -hmm. And when we moved to Western New York, and I was uh, fortunate enough to get this job with John. Oh, okay. So you so. didn't always live around here at that? No, no. no. Okay. Um, now, how did you wind up getting involved with the Watershed Conservancy? Well, right before we left, we were living in Maryland, and right before we left, I worked for the um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, federal government down there in, um, in Annapolis, Maryland. And I was working on a program which basically started to incorporate planting native plants um, in businesses, local schools, teaching people, again, just about the benefits of using natives versus ornamentals. Oh, um, oh yeah. So that oh. really got my, quote unquote, feet wet in terms mm -hmm. of um, being able to tell people um, about those benefits. So I sort of brought that with me and my passion for plants, um, and that's when we developed this program. Oh, good, so. good. Um, well, you're very passionate about it, oh. so that probably <laughs> makes you pretty good at it. It's oh. the things that people are passionate about that, <laughs> that they're really good at. Okay, now, lakescaping, um, I, I guess we can talk about lakescaping first. Um, how do you figure out what to do along the lake and what kind of plants are best to plant along the lake? Well, let me start first by saying, um, I think the hardest part for all of us as homeowners to realize is that everything that we do in our yard um, affects everything around us. Mm -hmm. So in terms of water, um, we all live in a watershed 
and everything that we again do in our yards ends up in our local waterways which inevitably end up in one of our lakes here mm -hmm. in Chautauqua Lake. Right. So yeah. it's really important to understand what what we do in our yards will make a difference. Oh, um, we, oh yeah. yeah. So uh, to answer your question around the lake, um, typically a, a lake that hasn't been disturbed or hasn't been developed is always going to have a, a buffer or a, um, a strip of wild native plants um, that surround it to protect it from all of that runoff that's coming off. And those consist of trees, shrubs, you know, flowering plants. Um, so it's sort of like, we like to say the lake's last defense before everything reaches the lake. As a way um, of filtering out toxins and correct. things. Correct, yep. Toxins, um, sediment, um, anything for instance that again you put in your yard whether it be an herbicide, a pesticide, any of those things, fertilizers um, that people use in their lawn, um, all ends up in the lake if not used properly mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately I think a lot of times it's overused so yes. yeah. Right, right. Um, but then getting to the, the, the idea of native plants, native plants, um, so many different types of benefits, but mainly one of the biggest ones is their adaptation to our environment here. So they, they know Western New York and they can survive our crazy winters um, and our hot spells sometimes, dry spells, uh, and they have incredibly long and strong root systems. Oh, oh, okay. So that is what is so important, again, for soaking up, using those nutrients, trapping that sediment. Um, I know it seems pretty magical when you start seeing things come up in the spring <laughs> after the winter without anybody having to do anything about it. So um, I did want to throw in one kind of uh, quick question. When you said something about we all live in a watershed, what about on a desert? <laughs> Is there a watershed there? You, it ca just caused me yeah. to wonder about that when you when That's you a said good that. question. I don't know if I can answer that properly, <laughs> but um, I would assume so. You've, you know, There's water somewhere correct. under the ground. It mm -hmm. might be a long ways down exactly. though, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. But I think the reason I was saying that, because I can't remember where I, actually I think it might have been Doug Tallamy. Um, he, he made a comment that I think it's 85 or 86 percent of the land east of the Mississippi is owned by, is privately owned. Oh. Which means oh, wow. there's a lot of people um, uh -huh. and a lot of development. Uh -huh. um, and I think we as homeowners and residents of where, obviously of where we live, we need to, to take that power and the control of being able to um, influence um, that part of our yard and property that we can because that's important. Um, there's not that many natural um, areas and habitat left out there, obviously. Yeah. That, that's a pretty high percentage. Oh, yeah. That's, so, yeah, what we do really, in our yards is important. That, yeah, that's really too bad. So uh, we should keep our lawns as natural as possible then, right? Well, that's, that's another good point. Um, a lot of people think development, when they think of development, they think of, um, you know, seeing a bulldozer or something and moving land and moving soil. Um, but to me and to a lot of other people, I think around, um, it's just as detrimental to see a large expanse of just lawn because there are no ecological benefits in to just, to having just grass. grass. No. So, and with the issues we're having with our local birds and um, local pollinators with their uh, populations being in decline, um, it's really important for us, again, as homeowners, to um, have something there available f for them because um, obviously they need that. And without birds and without insects, we're we're not going to be able to be here either, obviously. That's uh, what. Really, uh, <laughs> that, that really is a concern for me, you know, so I'm really into uh, protecting the pollinating in insects. So, um, okay, so are there any, um, 
uh, particular plants that you like to see growing along the lake that are make the good buffers and things? No, that's a great question. Um, it's also, it's, I'm trying. There, one of the pictures that we're going to be showing, it looked like goldenrod. Yes. Goldenrod. Um, and that grows all over out in the country and everything. And you know, it smells just wonderful. It, it's a wonderful native plant, and I know it can be, as we call it, aggressive. Obviously, like you said, you can you see it all over, mm -hmm. but um, it is what um, is typically termed a keystone plant. So it's extremely important what the timing of when it blooms and um, in terms of going into the fall and being a source of pollen for those in insects. And you also see on it too, um, if you look hard enough, a lot of times there's a gall on a lot of the, the goldenrod. It's right underneath, and you can see it in the winter, and there's actually wasps there, that will oh, there, live there, in it. Is that that kind of uh, oval-shaped uh, section mm -hmm. on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've got yeah, other... There, I, I have, when I was a little girl, I can remember uh, breaking one of those off, and all of a sudden, bugs came out of it. Well, <laughs> yeah. So, what's yeah. going on here? No, that's, you know? it's, it, there's other things besides, obviously, the bees. Um, mm -hmm. You know, utilizing it's, the flower. It's a really, it's a really good source of honey for the honeybees. Yes. The the goldenrod oh, is in absolutely. the fall, and the and the purple asters. They love those flowers. Yes, yeah. and again, important because of the time of year that they are blooming. Right, um, right. But to answer your question, along the um, uh, along the lakeside, uh, it's great to have habitat that is um, varied in its height and in terms of root depth, again, because of the way that it can um, absorb those nutrients and, and, and pick up sediment and pollution. So um, we like to see a, a combination of, of trees, shrubs, and perennials, because um, all of them together create that habitat that um, Everything from fish in the water mm -hmm. that will spawn or come up under the shade of the tree mm -hmm. um, to, the, to the frogs and water snakes that are in there, which I know some people might not like that, but they are there, <laughs> um, you know, to, to the birds and the, you know, every, all, everything all along the whole ecosystem. Actually, I, I like snakes myself. Well, so I'm, do I. I'm, so a big, I'm a big fan of snakes. <laughs> you know, I read somewhere one time that snakes, um, uh, save thousands of human lives every year as a, a because of the rodent control that they do. Yep. So absolutely. Uh, they help to keep the the rodent population. I actually had under a picture control. of a snake that I was going to put on, our, and then I was like, well, maybe I won't just because maybe. <laughs> but yes, I'm, I'm. I remember walking next to our vegetable garden one time one summer, and I heard a I heard a hissing noise, and I turned to see what was going on and uh, a snake had just grabbed uh, an, an animal in its mouth, you know, <laughs> it had been so there, to see. there just, to, uh, just in time to witness right. that. So, um, so that was pretty interesting. Yeah. And, um, okay, now how do you go about uh, figuring out what to do when getting ready to do landscaping for uh, people for like, for in their like in their lawns right. and like that. Well, what's well, what's really nice is it's again a one-on-one. -on -one, so we schedule an appointment, and again, it's free. Um, I come to your home, and basically, I the first 15 minutes, I just listen. I listen to what some of their issues might be, some of their um, what they would call problems, things that they might want to do in their yard. Um, an example of that might be a wet like a perennial wet spot that just they can't seem to dry up and it's... Oh, um, I've seen so, that in people's lawns. Yeah, yeah so yeah, that yeah. would be a wonderful place, let's say, for um, a rain garden mm -hmm. where you would incorporate, again, native plants that love to be wet and will soak up all of that water and, um, you know, also create a beautiful, you know, garden and habitat. Mm -hmm. um, so you're also, again, water quality and benefits for wildlife. So they really intertwine oh, okay. nicely. Can um, you think of any, uh, well, uh, would milkweed fit in there or not? The swamp milkweed would for, oh, for there, being it completely. It depends on the type of milkweed. Correct, oh, and that's okay. where I help. Um, 
typically I like to go around because we'll usually circle the entire yard um, and then we just pick what their priority spots are and I can um, offer them a design so I will design that area for them um, with the native plants depending upon again whether it's wet or if it's just a foundation planting that they're trying to capture that um, runoff off the roofs. Oh, oh um, yeah, yeah. So there's just so many different things. Or, it's, or some people just want to know, what can I do in my lawn? Like we were talking about fertilizer before, you know, what's the, oh, right, you know, right. what, what can I do? How can I change that to, you know, to yeah. better the water quality? And, you know, we talk about those different things like, mo you know, leaving your grass higher, um, only right. fertilizing in the fall if that, if, we always say, if at all. Yeah, um, yeah. Mulching. Well, you said that you could use mulch the leaves from your yard to use as fertilizer. Correct, and your lawn. grass. If you yeah. just re-mulch your grass, have a mulching mower, and re, uh, that is all the best natural free fertilizer that you can put um, without having to pay someone to, you know, to put it on there for you. Oh, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. So, um, yeah, there were some other things that uh, when you and I were discussing this talk on the phone, um, uh, like you were talking about using mulch in place of um, m certain mulches that people use. Are you were you meaning in place of those uh, wood chip things that so many people? What what is that stuff? Um, that people, so many people put around, you know, so they don't have to be pulling weeds all right. the time. Well, that, I mean, that is mulch, but if you just <clears throat> be cognizant of what type of mulch you're what buying. What it's made yes, out what of. what it's made out of, because some of it is dyed, has dye oh, in it. Oh, um, yeah. Some of it might, you just might have other types of things that they actually add in there. Oh, so if you can oh, get it more um, locally and you can find out where it's actually being made and processed. Um, and that's how your, it's being processed. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so definitely uh, be careful. I, I, yeah. I like to be for myself, it, yeah. absolutely. Um, and I'm yeah. not a fan of the dye just because it is, I mean, when it rains, you can see it come off. It's, um, so the natural brown is always, I think, looks really nice, and then obviously you're not adding anything to, right, right, to the mix there. I remember we were talking about this on the phone, and I remember telling you that when I was a little girl, I remember my grandfather uh, building something with boards around the cellar windows on the house, and and using leaves for to for insulating the yes. cellar, uh, you know, that way by keeping cold air from coming in yeah. the cellar windows. And then in the spring when the weather got warm, he'd remove all of that. And, and that's, I, I think I said this to you when we spoke, um, that is a great thing to use in your own personal gardens because mm -hmm. if you just leave, we say leave the leaves in the fall in your, in your garden and mm -hmm. they act as an insulator for all of the creatures that are actually living in that leaf litter mm -hmm. um, and you wait and then in the spring but not too quickly because there are lots of important um, insects caterpillars things like that that are actually wintering oh, mm -hmm. under those leaves so right mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. you really don't want to move remove it until the temperature you see I think they say mm -hmm. you see a week of a all above 50 degrees. A week of all above 50 degrees. Until you clean okay. out your gardens. Probably it would be good to wait until after the risk of having more snow. Uh, no. Because um, we get, I mean, you can get snow any time in April right. all the way through the end of the month. So, right. in fact, I saw deep snow. It was in the early 1990s. I remember deep snow the entire Mother's Day weekend in Chautauqua County. Oh yeah, that one year. That uh, <laughs> that had me worried. I'm thinking, what's happening to the climate now? You know. <laughs> well, I remember moving here from Maryland, and our first June, it was flurrying. Of the first week of June, I was like, Oh gosh, uh -oh, where what did, did I what get did myself? We do? <laughs> no. What did I get but myself? I don't Usually want you, not, but it can happen. <laughs> I don't want you to worry about the snow, though. Um, the snow is actually an insulator as well. Mm -hmm. um, what really it can be detrimental to plants in the winter is wind. Oh, so wind. Wind. Mm -hmm. So when you mm -hmm. take that layer of mulch, whether it be leaves, your natural mulch, even snow, 
and the wind just blows and blows and blows across the, that layer, that is where you're going to possibly see some issues with um, you know, plants dying over the winter. Um, but leaves are a wonderful insulator. I recommend that for people around newly planted trees in the fall is put, put a bunch of leaves around the, you know, around the crown of that plant and um, just take them off in the spring, just like you said. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, I, I, I remember you uh, mentioning something about um, that you work with insulating certain kinds of plants from the winter weather and uh, how do you do that? Are, uh, is there bushes and trees that you insulate to or uh, what, how, how do you go about doing that? I guess it just depends um, if you're doing when you're planting a plant. So for instance if you purchase a native plant um, and, and plant it in let's say September, mm -hmm. um, it's all, it's got its ball that you've it's come out of that pot. Well, it's for September into October, there's not much of a growing season left mm -hmm. for that plant to be able to spread its roots mm -hmm. into. Mm -hmm. So really you're looking at that plant is living in that ball mm -hmm. over the winter. So you really want to protect the crown of that plant. Does um, that mean like the top of it? No, the crown, I'm sorry, is where it, it comes out of the ground. Oh, okay. And then you're right, there's a crown of a tree, but I always, it's the crown of the okay. plant coming out. So that's just when you plant it. So for instance, if you're planting this spring, um, unless you feel like it's a, uh, a native plant that's a little bit more tender, mm -hmm. I guess, you might want to put leaves around it in the fall, but Given a spring planting, it has all summer and all fall to establish its root oh, system, okay. get in there, okay. get, um, you know, make its way through the ground, and then it will be protected again by the soil and the snow that's on top of <laughs> yeah. it, <laughs> usually. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I know sometimes my husband uh, makes comments that he thinks it's better to plant things in the fall than in the spring, certain things. Um, but. No, there is, I mean, there are some things, absolutely. It's just knowing which particular species that you're planting mm -hmm. um, and protecting them, again, mm -hmm. not only from the weather, but as we all know around here, deer, um, oh, especially yeah. if you're planting oh, a tree. Oh, yeah, sometimes yeah. So. Uh, when my husband plants a small plant, uh, he'll put a cage around it. Mm -hmm you yep. know, to keep yeah. the deer from eating it. So. Yeah, and we also have mice and chipmunk winter overwintering issues too that you have to be aware of as well. So yeah, there's always someone out there wanting to share in your planting. <laughs> Opportunists. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yes, opportunists. But, um, and that, oh. go ahead, I'm oh, sorry. No, uh, you can finish what you're saying. No, no, I was just gonna say that that just gets back to, again, the the, sort of the importance of using native plants is because right, right. Um, there's a lot of plants out there that when you're, you know, you're driving around Chautauqua County and you look on the side of the road, you're like, oh gosh, that's a, a wonderful forest or, mm -hmm. you know, natural area. Unfortunately, and it's not just Chautauqua County, it's the United States as a whole, is, is we have a very big problem with what we call invasive plants. Yeah, uh, um, they were getting brought in from other countries and yeah, things. Yeah, they, yeah, I mean, yes, and it's it's always been an issue, but it's unfortunately become more of an issue lately. And um, what happens is they not only outcompete our native plants, but because our birds, our native birds, and our native insects have evolved and learned to feed off of our natives, mm -hmm. when these invasives come in. Um, the amount of food that they can get from those species obviously is not um, as nutritious, maybe not as plentiful, um, and it really has, we've seen a remarkable, um, you know, decline in our native bird population, right, the migrating right. birds. Um, well, as, as far well as, as the pollinating insects go, um, there was somebody who said something to me one time about um, when the, it's kind of like uh, humans like eating junk food to eat the invasive, un, um, not, uh, not natural to this area right. uh, plants. Well, I think a good 
example of it is, um, are you familiar, familiar with butterfly bush? I, I've heard of it. Or, I've never actually okay. had one. I probably should get some. Well, no, no, I was going to say no. But <laughs> no, 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 is that an well, invasive? It, it, butterfly bush, um, unfortunately, is, um, is an invasive. Oh, really? And a lot of people love it because, hence its name, it attracts butterflies, um, bees, they love it. Um, but that is only one portion or benefit that that's really the only benefit that that plant can, can give to our, to our native insects. Um, on the flip side, you look at native butterfly weed. Oh, so there's something is, called butterfly weed. Yes, okay. and it's absolutely stunning. Actually, there's a picture. Oh, good. There's We're a gonna picture. Be it's the, it's at the it. orange picture. Um, okay. The orange flower. Okay. The difference between it is not only are you giving insects pollen, but their whole reproductive cycle system evolves on one plant. So the plant and the insect has, has evolved together. So the oh. milkweed, for instance, have you, um, as you've heard, yeah. um, the milkweed caterpillar needs milkweed in order to complete its life cycle. Mm -hmm. um, I can't tell you how many shrubs and perennials there are out there that that is the case for all um, of our mm -hmm. moths and mm -hmm. butterflies. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, you hear a lot about the monarch butterflies, uh, wanting, pe wanting people to um, protect the monarch butterflies, you know, uh, with correct um, food, practices, yes. you mm -hmm. know, with plants and things. Yeah. And, uh, but it includes all the other all them, butterflies, yes. too, not just the monarchs. Right, so. but it, that's a wonderful spokesperson, though, for, mm -hmm. for the butterfly world, mm -hmm. um, and ha always has been. But... Yeah, there's, and there's lots of different native milkweeds mm -hmm. um, yeah. out there. Yeah. So, Is there anything else that you plant in a butterfly garden? Um, it depends. I mean, there's, oh gosh, there's multiple. You can do everything. Like the goldenrod is wonderful to have oh, in there. Oh, okay. Well, what I like to suggest to people <clears throat> is to have something that blooms from May to October. Oh, oh, okay. So that you can, you know, you have something not only showy and, and blooming for you all year long, but you also have something that's available for um, whether it's the hummingbirds that arrive, you know, in the beginning of May uh -huh. um, to the first signs of the butterflies um, oh, okay. so coming this, in for nectar. This so, yes. would be certain types of flowers that bloom that entire, yes. that and, entire time. Yep. And then. it can be trees and shrubs, too. Uh -huh. It doesn't have just to be perennials. So, uh -huh. yes. And, um, and then, um, you know, I wanted to ask, you know, um, those little flowers you see, those little itty bitty ones that you see that are kind of a mixture of blue and white on people's lawns before they get around to mowing them the first time, is that the grasses natural flower or is that something else that grows in there? Do you know what I mean? It's I, those little itty bitty ones? I don't know if you're thinking like what I'm envisioning is Creeping Charlie. Creeping Charlie. I don't know if that's, um, it's just something what people would typically not want in their yard but all of those wonderful little flowers are so important. Um, we were just talking well, about this yesterday, well, love, even dandelions. I, I love seeing those little itty bitty ones. I don't know, it's just one of those early spring things that makes me so happy when oh, I see- it's a violet, is it a violet? No, no, because I know what violets okay. are. Uh, this is really itty bittier. Okay. You know, it's, re <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, it's no, just really, but it, they're really, and, really tiny, but you look out on somebody's lawn and that hasn't been mowed right. yet the first time, and you see all these little things, all of these little blue things showing, and it just right. it just feels so good to see it. And I wondered <laughs> if you could tell me what it was, because you well, see it on my, so many lawns. You well, know? well, I can ask as you take a picture and send it to me, and I'll tell you what it is. Oh, okay. I know, but that's what it sounds like to me, is what I call the creeping charm. Oh, okay. I'll, but, I'll, I'll take a picture yeah. when... Um, yeah, when you... Uh, as far as I know, I've never taken a picture of it. I'll have to look through okay. what I've what mm -hmm. I've already got, but if I can't find one, I'll... Yeah. I'll <laughs> but that sort of leads me, we are <clears throat> thinking, um, we just, I just read or was sent from a coworker a wonderful article um, about not, they're calling it No Mo May. No and, Mo May? Yes, and there's communities in, um, I believe it's Wisconsin, 
that actually band together and do not mow their yards in the month of May. They wait until June. Well, it's mainly because they allow all of those early spring, what people would say weeds, um, to come up and feed our early spring pollinators, which are so oh. important oh, yeah, um, yeah. to, and, and that, because and I'm sure you see the bees and um, oh, love yeah. dandelions, oh, clover. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's just a wonderful movement to uh, yeah, allow yeah, these. Yeah, that's, uh, I know that the honeybees love the dandelions. Uh, so it's good, you know, in the spring to let those to, blossom for the bees yeah. before you mow the lawn yes. the first time. And I always, I, I, I say to people too, if they're not so comfortable with doing that with their entire lawn, mm -hmm. do it with a, a patch. Mm -hmm. of just like mow a, mow a little circle or be creative and, you know, mow something, you know, kidney shaped or something mm -hmm. that's fun and just allow that to grow um, and be, be available to those pollinators because that's really important. Yeah, um, it really is. I, I know. Um, so uh, I, I, you know, I'm really concerned about them. So well, uh, and that's another reason too to be careful of and mindful of what you put on your lawn, right, whether it be right. fertilizers, um, herbicides, mm -hmm. pesticides. Um, all of those things have been found to be detrimental um, to our local pollinators, and then, unfortunately, those insects are being eaten by our local birds, um, and it's an unfortunate cycle that we, we want to make sure that we maybe stop <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> or I know. Imp improve, uh, I should say. I know. Um, I think I might have mentioned to you about that book that uh, that lady named Rachel Car Carson, Carson wrote back in the 1960s called um, Silent Spring. Uh, um, where she was, I read the book one time, and uh, ju just a few years ago, actually, mm -hmm. I, that I actually read it, and uh, for the first time, and she was talking about um, how uh, um, it, you know people were using pesticides uh, for the insects to kill off insects, but it was actually harming the birds more than it was the insects. A lot of the insects were building up a resistance to it. The insects that people felt were pests, it, but a lot of the birds were dying as, as a result. Right. So, um, and, that, and that's, a, I mean, a, again, a good point. Um, a lot of people see bugs on plants and think, oh my goodness, they're eating them or they're harming them. Mm -hmm. and, most of our native insects, if not all of them, um, I should say most of them, uh, again, have a relationship with those plants. So mm -hmm. they're not actually harming the plant at all. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those insects are also carnivorous and eat some of the bad insects. Some of the bad insects. Correct. Yes, so when, yes. you, you know, when you take everything out of your landscape, um, it's not working and functioning ecologically like mm -hmm. it should be mm -hmm. um, and that to me creates a sort of an unhealthy environment yeah, it does. and that's yeah. I don't think somebody once told me I think it was marigolds that somebody once told me that if you have a problem with um, the um, the squash and cucumber bugs that eat those plants the, uh, that you should plant like marigolds, I oh. think it was, between the rows of plants and that helps to discourage them from mm. Yep, I mean there's definitely, I know plants. there's some herbs too that they say to encourage or discourage deer <laughs> from coming around. I mean, I know there's, there's lots of tricks to the trade out there, absolutely. But yeah. those are all things that we discuss um, during this, during my Lakescapes visit, so it's, um, it even includes trimming trees, and but just teaching people about what is in their yard, mm -hmm. um, and I think people really appreciate that because mm -hmm. um, it's not not often that they get people to be able to do that and just literally, you know, take time to just walk and observe. And I think um, it's something that we need to do so we learn to appreciate what we have outside. And um, oh yeah, and for some people with the native plants, I even say to them. Um, even if you just plant one, that's one more than what was there. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, you'll be surprised what 
butterflies and insects find that one single plant that you that you put mm -hmm. in your yard. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember this one elderly lady telling me one time, uh, she was saying something about her son-in-law mowed her lawn, would mow her lawn for her, and she goes, but he never does anything about those, those yellow things, oh. those weeds. She was referring to the dandelions, so right. I wound up explaining to her <laughs> That, uh, that they're good for the honeybees and like that, and that uh, like the dandelion greens are actually something that's good for our health if we eat them. And I think they look beautiful myself, you know. So uh, I, I don't know why people make such a big issue out of dandelions. Well, now, I think it's something that was um, brought to society in the early 40s, 50s, maybe that yeah. um, the the a pristine lawn and landscape was, was a, a symbol of of wealth and um, mm -hmm. just of being a good person and you're taking care of your property and and um, it, it's I think we need to to get ourselves away from that and the fact that we sort of forgot. Mm -hmm. By doing that, we forgot about everything that we share our surroundings with. Right, right. Um, it's like uh, it's like it's not nature for our lawns to look too perfect. Correct. You know? And so. absolutely, you have kids, you know, and you want to have that lawn, and you want to, you know, play kickball or or have a badminton. You know, absolutely. But you know, places where you don't need to have that, let, let it go. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and what I recommend to people is, is just try it. The, the worst case scenario is you mow it, um, but let it go mm -hmm. and see. And, and, and then you just, what I typically do in our yard um, is we, well, my husband does for the most part for me, um, is we mow it once a year. Because if not, you'll start getting trees come up if you really want to keep it in, more in your of lawn, a... You, in the lawn, you mean? Well, it used to be lawn, but now we've let oh, it go. Oh, I see. Um, but to keep the, the trees from coming up, we prefer to have it more of a meadow. Um, because otherwise, yeah, if you don't mow, you will have trees. Correct. Starting and to grow, and then your lawn turns into a forest. And right, that's right. fine, too. It's all... My husband, we have 68 acres, so we have lots of forests. So oh, we, yeah. we like to have a little yeah. bit of open meadow. Um, oh, okay. To, and it's unbelievable the amount of birds um, that we see in that mm -hmm. area that we don't mow. It's oh, really cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, my husband seems to think in our area there used to be a lot more birds than there are now. Uh, yeah, he says... Compared to years ago, he says, uh, what we see now for birds isn't yes. very much, so. Well, I think a lot, again, bringing it back to the homeowner um, and looking more, more like broader, at a broader scale. I mean, these birds migrate, as you know, from, you know, from south to this time of year, all the, we're seeing lots of new, new right. species coming right. into, our, um, into our area. Right. Um, they need to stop along the way to eat. Right. And again, the problem is, is that all of that land where they used to stop has become fragmented, mainly due to development. Um, so they're flying over, you know, parking lots and buildings, and there's no place to find food. Mm -hmm. So that's, again, why we're saying homeowners can create those stopping places. And that's not only birds, but it's also insects okay. um, and butterflies right, that migrate. Right. Um, so it's sort of a stopover for all of these. So if we can incorporate these native plants, not only into um, you know into our yards, but into our communities, you know our businesses, all of those landscapes that surround all of our buildings, um, that would be a plus. And then it's also the the water quality factor of those plants with those stronger, longer roots are absorbing all of those nasty things that are flowing off of driveways and, you know, um, parking lots and can grab all of them before they get into the water. Oh, yeah. Who knows what but in all of that stuff. Yeah. Well, we have to move along to the pictures now. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, there's the bell tower. Yes, and that is a winterberry holly. Winterberry holly, okay. Yes. Um, beautiful native shrub, actually is a male female plant, so you need to um, plant both in order to get the berries. Oh, okay, so you ha uh, have, there's, they're separate? The, Correct. There they're, are male plants and female plants. Correct. They're not combined in yep. one, eat one yes. plant. Okay. So if you would go to a nursery to ask for this plant, you would need, again, both the male and the female, and there are different um, species which you want them to bloom at the same time so that the pollinators are pollinating them at the same time to get the berries. So, but this is a wonderful um, plant, obviously, because of its fruit. Mm -hmm. And the birds tend to like this, this plant in the spring when the berries get really soft and mushy. Oh, okay. So you and us as our landowners, we enjoy this beautiful plant all winter long um, with its berries and then the birds eat okay. them in so, the spring. So basically you plant those for birds. It isn't something that people eat. C correct. No, okay. that one is not. But there's quite a few, like blueberries are probably one of the best um, native shrubs that oh, we yeah. could plant for us and the birds. Oh, yeah. We and, have a few blueberry bushes yeah. at our house, yeah. And it's a beautiful landscape plant. People mm -hmm. don't realize, um, even just on, as a foundation plant around your house, mm -hmm. I mean, it has gorgeous fall color, mm -hmm. flowers, fruits. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, well, on to the next picture, and what is going on here? Well, this is an example on Chautauqua Lake of some beautiful lakefront buffers. So as you can see, these um, homes have let their buffers become natural and yeah. have you know, worked their docks and their um, walkways in amongst the vegetation. Mm -hmm. So again, everything running off the land and off the streets. Um, gets to be absorbed by all the this wonderful um, filtering system, plant vegetative filtering system. Yeah, that's a really so. nice picture of that neighborhood. And this is an example of the difference that you can see of mowing right to the lake uh -huh. versus allowing a natural buffer um, and native vegetation to grow. Yeah, I see. Um, it, all of that stuff could flow right down those banks Correct. Into the water right yes. there. And then you also, I didn't even mention um, erosion. Mm -hmm. um, those plants with those long, strong root systems also grab hold of the, of the soil there at the lakeside. Um, so when you have wave action and ice coming in in the winter, um, that all holds that together. So not only are you keeping your lakefront property, but you're also not allowing that sediment and soil to flow into the lake as well. So lots of different, lots of benefits for that. Mm -hmm. Again, just another wonderful example of um, a buffer. Of a buffer of yeah. people. Yeah, that look, and it looks nice that way too. It does. And um, there's the goldenrod. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Beautiful, but she's got um, a mixture of all different species here. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd love to, to mention that a lot of people, um, one of the biggest issues around the lake are those invasive plants. Oh, so when okay. I speak with, with lakefront homeowners, one of the biggest um, obstacles is trying to remove or try to outcompete those invasives and put some more native plants in there. So that is something that I'm able to teach them as well. Um, but goldenrod is a wonderful garden bully because um, it is native. It's wonderful to have, but and it does tend to kick things yeah. out of the way. <laughs> I've noticed out in the country where we live um, on our property, I've noticed that you can tell that there's different uh, species of goldenrod mm -hmm. because the different, the different plants don't all look uh, the same. Yep. No, so. exactly. So this was a wonderful um, it, it wasn't lakeside, but it's sort of lakeside um, garden that I created um, with a wonderful woman in Mayville. Oh. And this is a before oh. after shot. Oh, this is a Mayville? Um. Mm -hmm. This is literally down, um, down off of uh, Bird and Tree. 
Oh, okay. So the one on the right is the before one, is it? Correct. Okay. And the one on the left is the after. And this is just another example of an idea. If you don't want to have a manicured garden down by the lake and it's just too much, what you can do is you mow your grass as low as possible. Mm -hmm. You plant your native plants right into the grass. Mm -hmm. And then you allow them to grow up with the grass. Now she had chosen in the early stages so there wasn't competitions to, to keep the grass low in between all mm -hmm. the natives that she, she planted. But as over time, as those natives spread and get bigger, she'll be able to just leave that native grass to grow in between all of the flowers. Oh, when the other plants mm -hmm. get bigger, okay. Um, and uh, this is trees. Well, this was the beginning, this is the beginning shot of a um, Lakescapes demonstration garden that we put in um, Mayville at Lakeside Park. Oh, I um, thought it looked like Lakeside yeah. Park. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And um, this is another one that we worked with um, Winchester Dock Association in Lakewood. Uh, we put in a little miniature demonstration buffer garden around that giant um, ash tree there and what's wonderful is that whole um, area down there the, the people have stopped mowing along mm -hmm. the edge and it's beautiful that's mm -hmm. just another shot that, that's the first year it was growing mm -hmm. um, and we all struggle with maintenance and keeping those invasives out of there but we go back and um, and maintain it but after two to three years you'll see those native plants sort of just creep themselves in there and they'll mm. all of a sudden take over. Oh, okay. Uh, would you mention what that, those berries are? That's a, that's a native baneberry on the, um, on the left, a plant that, that you can see growing native in your woodland area. And that's something for the birds? Yes, not for us, correct. Okay. Um, um, now some, some berries that are okay for birds to eat are poisonous to us, is correct. that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and the one on the right is called, it's a wonderful ground cover called um, bearberry. Uh, bear berry. And that is literally only not even six inches tall. Oh, um, okay. And that grows actually very well in sandy soil. Oh, okay. Uh, but it's also uh, grows well around here as, as well. Oh, there's some butterflies. Yes. Yeah. So you've got your um, purple comb flower on the left, which is not native to Chautauqua County, but it is native to the United States. Oh, okay. um, and uh, then you have uh, New York ironweed on the right, which is a beautiful native here in New York, um, grows about six feet tall. It's now the one on the left, is th that somehow related to uh, daisies? I mean, it kind of has that look, except for, for the petals have the... Well, it's an echinacea, that's the... Um, the genus. Um, oh, okay. So, and that is the straight, it's not one of the varieties, um, it is the straight native um, that you find out in the prairies. And that's what I try to recommend to people. Um, we also support uh, our local native plant nurseries uh -huh. in Chautauqua County, uh -huh. and we like to um, suggest that you try, when you look for native plants, you want to try to get them as truly native as possible. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of what we call cultivars mm -hmm. out there, so they they take that native plant and then they tweak it depending upon whether they want um, the flower to be prettier or the berry to be darker red or mm -hmm. um, the plant to be small mm -hmm. versus tall. Mm -hmm. uh, but to, to actually be able to feed the birds, you're better off um, trying to find the, the straight native. Oh, okay. Now, in the previous picture to the ones that just came up, okay. on the right you called it, was it ironweed you called it? Yes. Yeah. New York ironweed. And that's good for the pollinating insects? Beautiful, because it is a fall bloomer. It oh. falls, uh, it falls, it, it blooms even later or around the time as goldenrod is blooming. Okay. Stunning, stunning plant. Oh, um, okay, we've got it yes. back there, yes. But like I said, it grows six feet tall, so there's only certain places that you would want to put that plant in, oh. your, in your yard. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Excuse yeah. me, um, but we can definitely find a place for it. Okay. The plant on the left is the butterfly weed that I was okay. telling you about. So the, that is the one that's a native plant. Correct. <laughs> It is one of the few native orange flowers, so I love incorporating that in our in our, my designs because it is orange is not a color you see out native in the wild, and um, 
the, the one on the right is actually our native, one of our native dogwoods. It's called a gray dogwood. Gray dogwood, mm -hmm. okay. Beautiful, as you can see, fall color. I took that, I believe, in September. Um, and the birds absolutely love those berries. Oh, good. So, and you have your um, beautiful New England aster on the left. Mm -hmm. And then on the right, you have a combination of the um, purple cone flowers. There's some summer phlox behind that. I can see a culver's root, that tall um, white flower sort of oh, in the background. Oh, in the background, yeah. Um, and this is what I'm referring to when I say give the garden two to three years and it will just sort of mm -hmm. fill up like this. And I literally clean it once a year and then I don't have to touch it again. Oh, yeah. And that's it's yeah. wonderful, very easy. Yeah, that's the best thing to do is uh, plant things like that, yeah. That will spread right, and that are, right. you know, again, have a purpose yeah. besides being beautiful. Right, right. Um, the tree on your left is a tulip tree. Oh, oh, it is, is that your... what they call a tulip poplar? Yes, oh, okay. and most okay. people do not realize how beautiful the flower is. Uh-huh. Um, well, you don't see see it for very long. Well, not only that, but typically they're so high up in the tree, you, you can't you, see you're it not unless you're... You're going to see them anyway <laughs> unless you climb up there. Exactly. But, but we, we're not trying to recommend that those of you in the viewing audience right. climb trees, though, because we don't want you to fall and get no, hurt. No, no. But you can, you'll see their seed pods on the ground um, right, right. in the fall. And then on the, on the right, obviously, is... Um, milkweed. Uh, I love oh, when oh, their yeah. pods break open oh, yeah, yeah. and their seeds disperse. Oh yeah. And, and the butterflies like that. Yes. Well, they eat the plant. They eat the whole darn thing. Oh, do they? Yes, they do. Wow. So um, this is Virginia creeper, um, a, a vine that I know a lot of people say, oh my goodness, Carol, I want to get rid of this because mm -hmm. it's all over the place, but it is a wonderful ground cover if you can train it to actually grow on the ground so that you can inhibit weeds. Mm -hmm. This one, um, actually, I took in Cape Cod mm -hmm. um, that was growing up a post. Oh, um, okay. But a wonderful um, for birds, as you can see, um, food source for birds. Mm -hmm. This is just another shot of one of the many gardens I have in my house. Um, I create mode paths around them and as I mentioned before I just sort of let them all grow in like that and it literally took me three years to have it become that. Um, I don't mulch it, um, I don't fertilize it, I don't really do anything except for clean out the dead stalks mm -hmm. in the later spring. Mm -hmm. So. And this is along the lake again. Uh, yes, this buffer actually plants. is a buffer um, that was put in Chautauqua Marina. Um, I'm not quite sure how many years ago, but a, a wonderful um, example of what you can do lakeside with not only rocks um, with, in terms of erosion and um, native plants. So you, you want to protect your shoreline, you know, if you have having companies coming in and doing, if you have like a native rock system there as well as the plants. You have both of them working together. Um, you'll be able to decrease erosion. Okay. And just again, more There's examples of... Um, a bu building in the back of those Oh, that's, yeah, that's my kids' swings. That's, yeah, oh, sing, oh. swing set. Oh, okay. But that's Culver's Root, another wonderful, um, gosh, bee-attracting plant but you need to plant it in the middle of your garden because it gets so tall, as you can see, that's every bit, oh. every bit of six feet tall. Yeah. You're talking um, about the one in the back background. Mm -hmm. In the background, The yeah. white one, yep. Yeah. So when I design gardens for people, I will think of those things so that you can have those taller species in the back, um, the smaller ones in the front, or however, uh, so you can attract all different types of pollinators. And again, absorb all of that, those nasties and yeah, and here we have a picture of fall leaves. Yeah, well, this is a sweet gum tree, which a sweet gum um, tree, sweet gum tree, which is a beautiful native tree um, that I was lucky enough. I did not plant it; it was planted in my yard when we bought it. Um, gorgeous fall color, but another example of of a native tree that, and a small native tree you can plant in your yard that won't get. 
too, too big. Oh, it's not too huge. Mm -hmm. And on the left is sassafras. Oh, oh. Another wonderful native plant. We another have, small we have one. some sand. Well, once you plant one, once you get it to take, we know because we plant, uh, my husband planted one in our yard one time. And after a while, little baby ones start <laughs> coming up. They do, yes. Yeah. Like to. Okay. And the other one was a red maple. A red maple. So when a lot of times when people, when I say red maple, they're thinking the crimson red maples that are red all summer long. Um, oh, oh, yeah. That yeah. actually is an invasive maple. Um, the the is, one that stay, is red all year long. It, oh. is, a, it is in the Norway maple family. Oh. Um, so we encourage people to plant our native red maple, which obviously gets red in the fall and oh, has much okay. smaller leaves. Oh, okay. Um, it's sort of hard to see. On the left is my um, native service berry blooming. Uh, one service of, berry? Service berry. It is one of my favorites all time because uh, you get these beautiful early white blooms in the spring. Um, in the summer, you get beautiful red berries for the birds, and I'll have flocks of um, birds just come in and annihilate. There's not a berry left. Oh, wow. And then there's, it's beautiful fall color, and for people that are, uh, again, worried about size and, and tree mess, if people are talking about, these are very small leaves, so they don't, it doesn't leave a mess, mm -hmm. and the tree only gets to be like 20 feet tall. It's, and and it's, what's going on on the right? That is a native witch hazel. Oh, witch hazel. Yes, which is a yes. wonderful native shrub that blooms in the fall. So yeah. I, obviously it's got its fall color and it still has a little hint of its flower. I like that um, purple uh, on the edge of it. Yeah, really it's, it's really, it's amazing, but it is, it's fun to have blooming um, shrubs that late. I think I took that in October. Oh, so, oh yeah. yeah. And this is along the lake both well, of them? well the lawn on the left is um, the pond uh, at my house so as you can see I leave a native um, buffer mm -hmm. and um, you'll probably laugh at this but I go along in my canoe mm -hmm. and I cut out all of my invasives in the spring um, oh, along the okay. edge so I try to encourage all of my natives so there we have the aster we have the goldenrod right. um, I know I have gray dogwood growing there um, as uh, yeah. as well as bone set, I believe, is there. Yeah. And then on the right, again, is Lakewood. Um, they have let their um, buffers grow, which is wonderful, and that is a sign that represents our wonderful program, Lakescapes program. That oh, yeah, there's if your sign. Yeah, yep. That if you're interested in, you are more than welcome to invite me over. Um, we can talk and I can help you incorporate um, these wonderful native gardens to help with water quality and wildlife habitat. Okay, um, would you um, tell the viewing audience before we close here uh, how they can get a hold of you oh, if sure. they want you to help them? Absolutely, um, the best, I can give you my um, email address is super easy, it's just carol um, at chautauquawatershed.org. Oh, Chautauqua at no, Carol. No, Carol at ChautauquaWatershed.org. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, or you can just look up Chautauqua Watershed Conservancy and get on our website. Um, I can give you the phone number too, and which is 716-664-2166, and I'm extension 2005. I hope I got that right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, you'll yes, probably please. Be, be hearing something from somebody. <laughs> no, that's, I'm already, I've had actually numerous um, Lakescapes consultations. I even did one on the phone to someone in California in January. Really? So, yes. Oh, my God. So, it was really exciting. They oh. come here, obviously, in the summer, and um, oh. they wanted, so. Oh, okay. I'd be happy to come over. Oh, okay. Well, thank so. you so much. I, I, Really appreciate it. This has been such an interesting <laughs> episode. And I'll see those of you in the viewing audience on the next episode. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs>